All right. So today's session or our session our session today is titled How We Win. And the idea behind it is that we're going to share the share hopefully practical tips and ideas that you can apply to your own careers and your own education. So as as most of you know here, I'm Felicia Jones. I am our student faculty coordinator here at the Mises Institute. With me, I have Dr. Jonathan Newman. He is our academic fellow at the Institute and Mr. Tho Bishop, and he is our content manager. Um, and like I said, we're just we're going to share hopefully some uh, great tips from our own experiences and help equip you as you move forward, changing hearts and minds. Um, so to share a little bit about myself, I obtained my uh, my undergraduate undergraduate and master's degrees from Troy University. I was an economics major in the business school. And um, one of the biggest lessons I learned early on from a professor was at the time I was considering PhD programs. And so I took a lot of math. And so I know this is a controversial topic uh, among Austrians, but if you're going to consider going into a PhD in um, economics program, consider taking plenty of consider taking calculus, consider taking linear algebra, differ, differential equations so that you're adequately prepared when you get to that program. And this applies to both mainstream and um, and free market programs. And so uh, just something to think about as you're as you're in your undergraduate education. Um, and so another another thing along those like academic preparation, is uh, join activities. Make sure that you know you're in your economics club or your or your liberty club, so that you have things to put on your resume. Another thing that was crucial, just towards like my own development, both as a um, you know both as a you know young professional, and but also just as like per part of personal development, was get a job. I cannot stress this enough. Do not graduate college without getting a job. And it doesn't matter whether it's in food service or retail um, or, you know, within your dorms at your college. Having that job experience, especially early on, teaches you valuable life skills and how to get along well with people. And each one of those skills contributes to the next job. So one of the things that I would say for myself personally is my education and economics got me the pay, but my work experience is what got me the job. So um, when I interviewed at the Mises Institute, it was I, I wasn't asked about um, oh you know what what classes did you take in un, you know in undergrad and grad school. They asked me okay what are useful skills that you learned, and that would be my my biggest recommendation for you. So along those lines, as students, we have some great programs for you. Um, as you're, although we are here at Mesa's University, this is a week-long conference that we really want to encourage you to network network with each other, get to know our faculties. You never know who you're going to meet next to you. They might have some great experiences, or you know, potentially, they could be a future colleague um, in the fields that you're in. Um, in addition to Mises U, we have other summer programs like Rothbard Graduate Seminar. It is for graduate students where you get to study uh, human action or man economy and state or um, all sorts of like crucial key Austrian texts. Uh, it is sponsored by uh, Miss Alice Lilly, our wonderful donor. And we really want to encourage you, especially if you're in a PhD program or a master's program, to apply and come join us in the summer. And then finally, we have our fellowship program. As we saw earlier this morning, we have wonderful, wonderful fellows. You know, they, they are constant. They're here all summer, and uh, they are constant joy for us. And basically what you can do if you're a summer fellow is research a topic of your choice and spend the entire summer working on a research project. Additionally, you'll have free entrance to Rothbard Graduate Seminar and Mises U. You get a dedicated research space and uh, free housing at Rothbard Village. 
So those are those are some of our like our programs that we want to encourage you to take advantage of. And uh, Mr. Bishop and Dr. Newman will share um, more about our book club and our apprenticeship program. So Dr. Newman, would you like to go ahead? Well, let me uh, first uh, plug the uh, the book club that's coming up. So in uh, starting in September, I'm going to be having weekly virtual meetings with a very select group of students. And we're, we're going to be uh, discussing the chapters of Four New Liberties. So it's a great uh, text, and I look forward to doing that. So make sure you sign up for that. There's information about it out in, in the uh, conservatory. Um, in terms of advancing liberty in your career, the, the sorts of advice that I have that would, that would be generally applicable, but it seemed, it, there are things that I've learned uh, as an academic. The, the first thing is be easy to work with. Th this is something that applies everywhere. But don't don't be the don't be the stick in the mud. Don't be the person who's always arguing. I mean, you know, stick up for your principles and everything. But also, don't don't be the guy that uh, that once you leave the meeting, everybody else is chit chatting about saying, "Man, this guy's you know, it's terrible to work with." So so be easy to work with. Um, do, say yes to things. Uh, so when when people ask you to to do you know the the mundane sorts of things, don't. Don't turn your nose up at it and, and think that you're above it, especially early on in your career. You've got to you've got to say yes more often than you say no. So you've got to have your boundaries, but you've also got to you've got you've got to show that you're willing to to step up to the plate for whatever institution or organization you work for. <clears throat> and in so doing, you you will just naturally uh, grow in in terms of your reputation. You will develop a network, so people will think about you and, and think highly of you when. When promotions come up, when new projects come up, and and they'll they'll ask you to do those sorts of things, the things that you want to do. So you've got to do the things that you don't want to do before you can do the things that you want to do. So so develop that network and, and rely on them, and also be a good member of that network. So when you see positions open that might not work for you, but you think that uh, it would work for somebody else, make sure you send that uh, their way, or or at least. Uh, uh, broadly publish it like in a group chat or something like that to to your to your group so so participate in a network and and be conscious of that especially at events like this where you're meeting a bunch of new people from all over the place so it, it was through my my own connections that I got information about positions that that I wanted to apply to and so like when I went to uh, Bryan College that that the opening there was was given to me or it was uh, shown to me by somebody I met here at uh, at Mises U. Um, so so it's it's very very important to to make use of the network. The 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 last thing uh, that I'll mention is that um, let's see I said uh, be easy to work with use a network and man there was one other thing. Oh, I'm blinking. Well, let's move over to Tho. <laughs> well, I try to remember what the what the last thing. I had one one more thing. Give me a second. Oh, we'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, perspective. I'm um, I'm gonna turn on my microphone first. So, I'm um, my perspective within this is um, a professional pursuit within sort of the, in, the the ideological space or being able to take away what we've learned this week and applying it within the professional space. From outside of a, a credentialed perspective, um, I'm, I'm a college dropout. Um, but when I was young, I was very interested in the ideas. I got tired of of the college sort of of game, and so what I did is I dedicated myself to reading. I, I read Mises.org every single day. I'd pick up a lot of books. I, I'd read them during my breaks. One of my best jobs was dealing uh, with the uh, oil spill cleanup during the the BP oil spill thing. Uh, we didn't get a lot of oil over where I was in, in Panama City Beach, so you had you know a lot of a lot of breaks in between that. Um, so I got to read a whole bunch of, of, of Mises Institute books during that time. What I did is I sharpened um, intellectual tools that I've been able to apply uh, throughout the rest of my career, and, and in some ways, some of the some of the, the best intellectual capital I have okay, kind of came from those early days reading and reading and reading non or uh, writing and writing. Reading and writing uh, during those times can help, help really kind of build an intellectual foundation for for what it was that that inspired me. Um, now, one interesting outlet that allowed me to to help kind of get to where I was now was kind of the, the dark arts of politics. Um, 
because politics, it, the, the way that I, I came here was was I, I helped uh, helped with some political campaigns for a, a man that became the chairman of the Financial Services Committee. And so from that, when I was on D.C., I got to meet some connections. Um, and combined with my, my love of the Mises Institute, it, it led me here, and I have been, been haven't been kicked out yet. Um, but it's also interesting, it's like once you have, like within politics, you get a lot of mediocrities. You have a lot of people who's, you know, they're, they're in politics because they see it as a means to, to get power, as a means to grow their ego. Uh, maybe they, they don't have a lot of confidence that they're going to make the salary they think that they deserve because that's what their parents did. And so therefore their lobbyists, uh, uh, you know, grandfather can get them connected to a really nice office very, very easily. Um, so you're dealing with a lot of mediocre individuals in, in you know, nice suits um, with, um, when you get to Capitol Hill. If you have an ideological passion, if you have something that motivates you, it's, it's remarkable the ways that you can find to, to, to do it. So like one of the little jobs that I had was um, you know, creating clips in the morning. So, like, you know, creating a, a, a daily email of all of the, like, the, the headlines that people needed to, to read. Well, because I got to decide what were the clips within that, I'd include Mises.org. I'd include, um, I remember sharing a lot of, of Mark Thornton and Karen DeCoster's work on um, uh, the housing bubble um, because that was obviously a big topic of interest. And so, you know, having little, little footholds where you have something that ideologically drives you, you can identify ways to put it into practice. Uh, now, the problem with politics, of course, is that D.C. is an evil, evil place. Um, I, I'd, I'd be skeptical of anyone that enjoys being there for a prolonged period of time. I got, I got out after a couple of years. Um, but going back to some of the, the things we've been talking about, the importance of networks, the importance of, of um, you know, being sociable, of being able to create these ties. Um, a few years ago, uh, Donald Trump nominated a really, really horrible economist to be Federal Reserve Chair. Or to be a Federal Reserve uh, on the Board of Governors. I was a guy named Marvin Goodfriend. Um, he was someone that was promoted by Cato and Heritage. He said nice things about rules-based monetary policy, and therefore this is going to be a great guy. It's a great thing. Well, I went back, and I, I was started reading his most recent stuff, which included a 2016 speech he gave at uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And it was all about how we needed negative interest rates, how we needed a, a fully digital currency, um, for the same reasons we needed to get off the, the gold standard. This is just a natural update of the monetary framework that gives the state more control and can help us deal with the business cycles and the like that we know are very, very bad. Um, he even suggested that, hey, look, politically getting rid of cash in the short term might not be politically um, feasible. So therefore, I've got this great idea. We're going to break the, the uh, value of paper currency from electronic currency. You put a $100, uh, $100 note in your bank account, and you get $99 in your account, and you're going to kind of erode away the use of paper cash through these mechanisms. I mean, it was it was a, a, a brilliant work of evil genius. Because I had networks in D.C., um, I had a friend that worked for an, uh, an office with uh, Senator Mike Lee. Um, he was very interested in some private immigration solutions, and so we, we you know, he's someone on the Hill that the way he started every single day was reading antiwar.com, Mises.org, and LeeRockwell.com, so that's a good guy to find. Um, he was able to, to take my arguments about why Marvin Goodfriend was the first, worst Federal Reserve nominee of all time. He was able to convince his boss. Now, because he had a dynamic where you needed every single Republican to support, um, and Senator Lee happened to be the person that was in charge of deciding when nominations were voted on, Marvin Goodfriend's nomination never went up to vote, and it expired. And so my buddy and I were able to kind of single-handedly stop a, a really bad Trump Federal Reserve nominee. And when you consider just the, the extent of his bad ideas, again, like he's one of the intellectual leaders of you know, digital cash and the like, there are ways of, of being able to make some changes in the margins. But ultimately, this, is not, this, this requires networks and requires giving a damn. It requires not resting in your laurels. It requires not being in a state of self-satisfaction where you've, you've convinced yourself – that you know some some generic framework is you know you, you don't you don't become intellectually discurious because you become content on where you are. You need to constantly be engaging with the news cycle, engaging you know, constantly reading new books, constantly trying to to better comprehend. Um, you know what what is it that drives people 
to other ideas? What is it that drives people to be skeptical of our ideas? How can we blend the middle road there? So of course, there's ways of doing this outside of politics. Content creation generally has a great opportunity right now. Um, there, there's a, Will Blakely is here. Uh, he's a reporter for 1819 News um, in Alabama. He does, I, th I think, one of my favorite um, writers right now because he applies a lot of what he learned as a Mises U alum. Um, that gives you a really good analysis for kind of you know, identifying cronyism and all these sort of, of bad actors in politics. And he applies it to local news. And uh, I think within the content environment, so much as we, you know, we get so distracted by the national circus, we get distracted by national politics. It's being able to apply this into your own area where you have an area of, of competitive advantage, right? If, if you were to go to your local library and read, spend you know, four hours reading your local history, you will know more about your local town than 99% of the people in your community. That, that can provide value. Whether you're, you're interested in, in politics, whether you're interested in analysis, whether you're just interested in being respected in a variety of ways, this, you know, the, these are ways to, to, to do it. Localize your knowledge. You focus, you know, there's, there's so little interest in state analysis, so little interest in you know, the, the consequences for the tax policies of your, your local county commission. Um, again, all of us are now equipped with a framework that makes us better at doing this than the overwhelming majority of the people in your community. So we, this is a very easy way for us to create a competitive advantage. Uh, another aspect, of course, is the larger discourse of, of ideas. And so with the Mises Apprentice program, we're, 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 this is our first run on identifying ways in which we can you know, engage in the, the ever-changing battleground of, of intellectual debate. Um, you know, we've got wonderful, wonderful you know, people who are, are, are in many ways already extremely um, uh, established in the run, right? You know, people like Jess Gill that does wonderful work from, from the UK and a lot of great videos for a variety of organizations. We've got David Brady who, who has now beaten me because he, he, he's now on, uh, made it on, on Human Action Podcast with Bob Murphy uh, because of an article. We've got, we've got Sam Peterson who is, uh, you know, just making it rain uh, essay contest awards with his own writing, uh, which is very Im impressive. Um, we, we've got Joseph Rich, who's got the Austrian Economics Discord channel, which I, th I think is uh, one of the, the great intellectual organizations in the Austrian movement today. I highly encourage everyone to check it out. Um, and you know, those, those are just the four here. Um, but you know, we want to identify talent out there. We want to, to help you know, constantly seek self-improvement and then engage ever more boldly within this battleground. Because again, we, we all know we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, but it is, it is a battle that we have all chosen by being here, and we owe it to ourselves to give us our best chance. And so that's uh, happy, happy to talk more about uh, you know, the way that we can apply these ideas within these various different spheres. I did remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's actually a great segue. On that note of self-improvement, one thing that has been critical for me is, is finding the people who will give you honest feedback and be willing to listen to what they say. So... Uh, you have to be very brutal with yourself in terms of the skills that you have and the skills that you don't have. And when, when you're doing these different projects, when you're writing, when you're speaking, when you're doing podcasts, if, if you notice uh, that like you're not doing this as well as you'd like to, then s send the product to your friend's way or on your friend's way and, and ask them for like very honest, critical feedback, uh, and they will they will point out the things that you did well and, and the areas that you can improve. This is really really important for self improvement so that you can get better and be more well rounded in, in all of these different aspects, where that's writing or speaking or interviews and in anything that you're doing. So so find those people, but also be that person for your friends as well. So this goes back to you know being being a good member of of your network. So. When you're collaborating, especially when you're collaborating with other people, make sure that you're holding the standard high. Make sure that the the final product that goes out that has your name and the other person's name on it is uh, something that you're proud of, and and that will only come by iron sharpening iron. So 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 be that person. So before I open it for a Q and A part, one thing I do also just want to mention, and this is not an afterthought, but actually the most important piece that we could share with you today is that in order for the liberty movement to be successful is that we need virtuous people. We need ethical people. We need, we need libertarian, you know, we need libertarians. Yeah. 
we need libertarians that care tremendously about not just their work ethic, but being honest and being true because without that, we're just, we're just a sounding board. We're just happy little Twitter, you know, you know Twitter people like, and that's not effective, right? Being good people is how we, is how, is how we win. And, uh, and so I really, I can't emphasize that enough uh, because if we're not good people first, you know, whether it's based upon your own faith or based upon, you know, these foundational principles that you hold dear, self, you know, self-evaluation, then, then we're not going to win, right? We're not, liberty won't prevail. So we need to be good people. Um, so now I'm going to open up for the Q&A if you have any questions. Um, yeah, we're happy to help answer them. Might you say without such virtue, the liberty wouldn't last more than three generations? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I will bring up the papal army again, but um, <laughs> uh, do you guys have any advice, uh, especially for Jonathan, on how you deal with like um, conflicts within academia? Because you're, you know, you're taking, for lack of a better word, a very heterodox approach, right? That wouldn't be welcome among many people. So you talked about not being conflicting, but you kind of have to be right if you want to stick by your principles. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. There, there are two different philosophies. Uh, one is uh, to basically keep it hidden, so stay in the closet, basically, and and then basically once you finally work your way up and get get your tenured position, then you can unveil so that with the shirt. You've got the big A for Austrian. <laughs> So, th so that's one way to go about it. That's not the the method that I chose. I, uh, I, um, I, I never hid the Mises Institute on my on my CV. Um, I was always involved with their events and writing for them and doing that sort of thing. And uh, I mean, it did it did mean that I would have like the occasional debate with my professors. But I tried I tried to go about it in a in a nice way. I was never combative. I was I was never. Um, I would never, you know, like point my finger at them and say, you're wrong, that sort of thing. I, it was always a nice sort of uh, conversation that I would have. And I think I think that was beneficial. I think my professors thought better of me because of that. So so if if you can go about it in a way where where you're impressing the faculty with how much you know about their side and also your own side, um, and you can do it in, in a way that where you're still friends, you still get along, then, then I would I would do it that way. Now, of course, when it, when it comes time to go on the job market, there, there are some programs and some departments are going to look at the things on your CV and, and they, might, they might not like the fact that you have certain things on your CV. I, I don't recommend hiding it. I, I recommend, you know, uh, what that means, if you did hide it, it means that you would be putting yourself in a department where you have hostile coworkers. So you should, you should self-select into departments where they're going to be more tolerant of those of those views. So that's why I'm a proponent of the view of just d work on the things and, and do the writing that you want to do now and don't try to hide your Austrian views now, but but still do it in, in a nice way, in a friendly way. I do want to add on to that, uh, Dr. Newman. I have, I have a very good friend of mine who kind of went the route of uh, let me go to a PhD program that's super well ranked and he was miserable because he had very hostile professors and um, he ended up taking a gap year and then decided, no, I still want to get a PhD in economics. And then he went to a free market program. And so um, while, yeah, it's still your choice, whether you want to go mainstream or um, more like free market oriented programs, uh, it's still an evaluation you're going to have to, a self-evaluation you're going to have to take. But one thing that is really nice about going to a free market program is that you'll come across mentors and really good mentors who will work with you to improve your writing to, so that you become a better researcher. Um, and so I would just encourage like make, when you're doing that trade, you know, think about those trade-offs, like that's something to think about. Yes, uh, thank you all for being here. I think Luke actually stole my original question, so I have to raise a Protestant army to go and conquer him now. Um, 
but actually the question that I had was a lot of our conversation is centered around older people, specifically like adults and having a, a discourse and dialect with people who are already mature in their own ideas. What advice could you give about maybe interacting with a younger group who is still young in their idea of formation and converting those hearts and minds before you have to go back and undo the knot of, of, uh, of roots in their thinking and straighten them out, so to speak? Um, that's, it's a good question. And I think there's a lot of opportunity right now where, um, you know, they're, 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 you have a lot more political engagement at a, at a younger age, or perhaps unfortunately at times, you know, but there's, you know, the kind of the discomfort, um, you know, you, you see, it's, it's interesting. I think within the kind of the current environment, a lot of, you know, 18 year old, people that kind of become like big Trump people. <laughs> they, they, these were the people that would have been Ron Paul people back in like 2008, right? Like they, they, they're kind of responding to a, a certain level of, of, of edginess to a certain extent that kind of Ron Paul's campaign was really able to, you know, had many different elements that kind of made it such an interesting intellectual uh, reaction. And, and I, I think there's, there's an element within the way the current political environment is, is doing that. For, for less radical figures, obviously, um, but but it's it's creating this sort of resistance to the culture that is being pushed upon them in a variety of different platforms, a variety of different ways, and I think ultimately for them to get to a dynamic to which they want to engage with in our sort of content, it first requires you, you have to light that that candle that I need to think for myself, and I, I think this, the large percent of the population doesn't want to think for themselves, right? You know, they, 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 they want to make choices kind of that they're given and just kind of go along with it. You, you, you need that original spark. Um, at least that's in, in, in terms of getting, you know, perhaps getting a young person to, to Mises you or, or to reading a, a book from our bookstore. Now, in terms of, you know, more broader things on just, you know, not hating uh, uh, capitalism, not hate, you know, maybe, maybe never getting to, to knowing the name Murray Rothbard, but just kind of, you know, not being a commie. Um, you know, I, I think one of the areas where the left has made a tremendous amount of gains has been their taking over their, 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 their willingness to take over institutions. And we're kind of seeing education in particular being a very interesting front line right now where parental rights groups are kind of the closest thing that conservatives have to kind of like civil rights groups of our day. Right. And so you're motivating parents to go to school boards and they're yelling at, you know, horrific books in their, in their curriculum and, you know, to me, I see an opportunity here where if there's a recognition that what is being taught in our classrooms deserve, is, is, is either bad or deserves scrutiny, then, you know, how do we get – like, yeah, if, if, if any of you out there are not interested in going on a postgraduate path but are interested in putting these ideas to practice, you know, being a – there's nothing wrong with being a history economics teacher, right? A lot of people, they don't think about economics. They're, they're not they're – not, they don't come across the turn of the concepts until they get to high school. Um, you know, being a, a history teacher, being a civics teacher, right? You know, the ability, particularly within history, of being able to shape the narrative. You know, the, the left was so good at being able to kind of, you know, you, you have this sort of Howard Zinification of American history that ends up getting, you know, regurgitated out there. Again, if we take that that sort of Rothbardian class analysis we talked about on Radio Rothbard and apply that down, I'm um, obviously see, you see a very interesting void right now with um, uh, the, the Tuttle twins trying to do, doing work in this field. Um, with the builder for for a for, for some younger audiences there, but I think there's a tremendous amount of entrepreneurial opportunity in terms of creating content for explicitly younger audiences, not just you know college age. Um, so I, I think there's 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 some opp opportunities here for 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 us to, to kind of help uh, fill that void. Hey, my question is directed towards though uh, we had talked about uh, cronyism. Uh, I wanted you to expand on that and go over some of the um, utilities for our school of thought and some of the dangers of it and whether or not you think pretty much we should be expanding uh, our efforts into being cronies uh, as Austrians. Well, I, I think there's a dynamic to which, you know, we, we need people that are, are moral people, virtuous people, but we also need successful people, right? You know, 
the, the, the institute is able to be the institute because of economic gains made outside of the pure theory of ideas, right? We, we're very fortunate that we have professors here with us that cared enough about the institute to actually be donors. Uh, but we want donors that have bigger paychecks than our academics. Um, unless you're, you're Horeto de Soto, then, then you know, that's, that, that, can, that can work out there. Um, and so the reality is, is that unfortunately there are certain fields that are kind of captured by proneous areas. What, 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 I, what, I think, what I think is a negative way of taking these ideas, right? And you, you kind of get this with – I, I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan, but there's sort of like a – there's an issue where I think young if, – if you first interact with Austrian economics and then you learn P Peter Schiff was right. And then Peter Schiff tells you the entire financial industry is a bubble, so therefore don't get into it. If you took that advice, and I've, I've said one that I didn't have a lot of funds to invest, but I bought gold rather than stocks. Taking that advice in 2011, 2012 was a bad idea, right? And so understanding the way that this warped, captured economy actually functions beyond our moral understanding of it and being able to, you know, if, if you have – a niche within it where you know you can provide a skill, but that skill is heavily cartelized. Don't avoid the industry because it's cartelized and that you find that morally offensive. Be the be the best you can within the the, the confines that are there. Um, the problem is when you when you then become the special interest group that wants to further intervene within the economy, creep you know, make this these problems worse and worse. We should always work to be positive forces. With where, whatever standing we have in society, we should always be working to, to embrace laissez-faire. We should be working towards um, liberalizing with, within a Rothbardian sense. But we shouldn't be afraid of being successful within areas of society that are not currently within a, a Rothbardian framework. Just... Okay. <laughs> hey, what advice would you give to people who already work on the field of liberty and how to, can they keep like uh, advancing liberty and learning more theory and applying this theory in the field they already are in, in the political sense? So I would definitely make use of like all of the literature that's on Mises.org. So it, like everything that Mises publishes is available for free online. I, you, could, you could spend multiple lifetimes just reading everything. So, so the answer is read, read, read. And read some more. And also, like, one of um, Murray Rothbard's greatest attributes, and, and we are so extremely lucky that he, he, he had this, is that he wasn't only a great economist, which would have been successful enough in its own right to, to make a huge difference in civilized society. He wasn't simply a great historian, where his work alone, if, you, if he never wrote Man, Economy, and State, and he just produced his economic history, then that would have been good enough. It's not just him as a political theorist, where he would have held himself up as an original political contributor to uh, libertarian ethics. I mean, you talk to scholars in Poland, and, and Rothbard, as a political philosopher, is treated alongside Locke and the other greats within the Jewish tradition. It's very, very fascinating there. But he wasn't content to simply being a armchair intellectual, um, no matter how great he was at that. He was always interested in constantly identifying how do we, how do we, how do we find new markets for our ideas? And recognizing that the markets are not simply only going to be intellectuals and scholars, but it's going to be political activists and radicals. And I mean, this this is a guy that, you know, I mean, he, he was willing to hang out with like smelly hippies in the 1960s, um, you know, cranking out radical propaganda with a typewriter because he thought that this was an opportunity to get, you know, more and more people consuming Mises, consuming, you know, the, the core work there. And I think there's something incredible about that willingness to do so. It, 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 he, 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 it cost him professionally because of that, but it, it's also why he is so well read today. And so one of the things that Rothbard was so good about was obviously constantly trying to to look at intellectual coalitions, ideological coalitions, right? Um, so if when, when war, the Vietnam War was a big area, right? He reached out to the left when um, concerns, when, when, when cold, after the Cold War, right? And, and you had the old right trying to bring back in um, trying to reverse some of the, the the expansionist militarism of the Cold War era, he reached out to Pat Buchanan, the old right. I think trying trying to to figure out 
you know, we, we, there, there's so many different arguments that we have within our portfolio. We've, we've heard arguments about income inequality. We've heard arguments about human prosperity. We've heard arguments about social cooperation. There, there, there's all these different types of, of moral arguments that are going to work with certain different audiences than others. Trying to, to take these specific arguments and appeals and identifying, you know, what is the area of society that is not the, you, you, you it, it requires just a level of entrepreneurship, but I, I think it's it's the willingness to to change our approach within the confines of the tradition. We're we not discarding the tradition, but trying to identify different types of arguments that have different types of emotional appeals that all go back to a desire for a freer society. I think it, it's it's something that that can't stay stagnant. It, con- it, it requires constant working, and um, uh, you know, I think I think the more that you can read from Rothbard's articles on political strategy. As a, as a field itself, I think that it's it's a great catalyst for trying to think about this in modern society. Well, one other way to emulate Rothbard in this respect is to look at the way he read. So hopefully you've had a chance to flip through some of his books. He he was not just like skimming. He was he was not just you know taking all of this uh, all of these ideas and just sort of like shrugging your shoulders. Yeah, he was. If you look in the margins of his books, there's X's everywhere there's check marks everywhere sometimes there are things that are worse than an x right <laughs> so he was he was constantly evaluating what he was reading he wasn't just reading a lot which he did do but he was also thinking critically about everything that he was reading and 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 trying to relate it to the mezesian paradigm that he had he had inherited so so don't don't just don't just don't let your eyes sort of glaze over while you're reading. Constantly evaluate. Ask, is this true? If it is true, why is it true? So ask those sorts of questions while while you're doing the reading. And I'm going to add on one more point, just just to um, just maybe some more like um, applicable like a, applicable knowledge as well is um, in terms of like answering that question of like trying to move Liberty forward and applying it to your own career. Um, one recommendation I have is that continuously evaluate yourself and where you're at in your, in your career. Like, are you at a, are you in a position that you're, you're not growing? And if you're not, then keep looking. I mean, the reality right now with, um, with our generation is that unless you keep job hopping, unless you keep moving, getting new jobs and continuing to interview and, um, essentially, you know, look out for your own interest, um, you will stagnate. And so one thing I would recommend, especially in terms of moving Liberty forward, you know, is, you know, is keep moving, keep moving up in whatever industry you're, you're in, um, and find industries or find companies that are passionate about the same things you are. My husband, um, he works for a, uh, you know, a crypto, a crypto hosting company and he goes to work and, you know, while there's always going to be like office drama, but he comes home and he loves what he does. And he, you know, he, not only does he love what he does, but he feels like he's making a difference in the greater, um, like Liberty movement. And, and he, and he's an IT guy. And so you know, he's not an economist. So really, I just want to encourage each one of you, you know, if you don't go into academia, go into industry and continue to um, apply those principles um, and get into positions where, you know, you can make effective change. So this question is primarily directed at Fo. But what advice would you have for any sort of upstart um, content creators, whether they are podcasters or live streamers like on YouTube or video essayists or writers on Substack? Um, like, would you have any, like in order to gain, I guess, traction or in order to make their work more concise? Like, what would, you be, what would be your advice for that? I, I think... Providing, yeah, I, I think identifying small niches on the margin where content is not being provided. So I, I think one, one of the mistakes that I often see, you know, the, the reason why there's so many libertarian podcasts and, and very few of them are worth worth listening to is because like there's everyone's interested in giving the libertarian perspective on X, Y, and Z, right? And it's the, for first and foremost, like if you're 20 years old, like you, you, your perspective is not that interesting to begin with. <laughs> um, and so, and, and then it's the content so general that. 
at that point, you have to rely upon either, you know, perhaps um, edgy humor. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's a way offsetting it with some sort of technological advancement. Maybe, maybe you can create some sort of optics. You, you have a great voice or something like that. You know, so there, there's, there's ways, perhaps, of distinguishing yourself within sort of that generic content. But, but I think it's difficult to find. I, 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 you know, if, if, you, if you have that confidence in it, you're, you're going to be fine in your own right. So I think what's better off is to try to identify a specific niche. And again, it could be something as simple as, um, you know, taking political analysis and applying it to your state. It could be finding a, an interesting country. Um, you know, I, I, it could be, um, you know, I, I, sports economics is a sort of a field of study that, that I, I think has opportunities within the Austrian school to apply. So, so finding something there, you know, but, but trying to find a, 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 a unique novel area that is is not reliant upon giving the hottest libertarian X take on X, Y, and Z. That would be my, my suggestion for prolonged success. It's not that you can't have some sort of viral, you know, banger of a tweet go off and, and have some some viral aspect from that. That's that's possible. But I think in terms of best likelihood for sustained success, it's it's having a very defined niche little market that you can build on and you build like a, a, a respectability from kind of specializing within a field. I dislike reading the news uh, just because I find it depressing. Uh, how how would I uh, – what would your advice be for uh, someone to get better at reading the news without being black-pilled, for lack of a better term? That's a good good question. I, uh, I, that's, that's the problem. Is that you, zero Hedge is very entertaining, but like you know, six, six months of Zero Hedge and um, running for the exits. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I, I think I think something that's important is to have real life people in your that, that that you can talk to about it. Because if 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 it's so easy, I think to feel sort of isolated and alienated if the only means by which you're having these sort of conversations is sort of you in a in a in a digital device. Um, you know, I I think I I, th I think religion helps. Within this, right, I, I think that in terms of dealing with um, the, the difficulties that exist within a fallen world, which we are all kind of – it's kind of the, the underlying catalyst for all this, I, I think finding something and, – and I, I, think, I, I think some people find a kind of a religious devotion to libertarianism as well, right? So I, I – you know, I, I don't. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to project necessarily that you know you need to go join your Presbyterian church. You know, I, I think that the most happy warriors, even someone like Walter Block, like he has, you know, almost a religious like, um, I'm convinced, you know, a, a dedication to you know this is something that will win in the end, right? It's, it's, it's sort of Christianity without Christ in some ways. Um, but but I, I think I think that helps, right? You, you you need those 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 happy pills. Um, but then having people with, that you can talk to within it that you can respect you know I, I because it, it is i mean this is the this is the burden that we have is that we are trying to to battle the most powerful government entity that has ever existed in a society that seems hell-bent on destroying itself with all of the financial interest at play apparently dedicated to the eradication of the human race i mean this is not a this 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 is not a battle that should be taken lightly and i, I think that that you know, it, it is important to take this stuff seriously. Mises and Rothbard were successful because they took this stuff seriously. And I think all of us have a, a, a obligation to do the same. So to add to that, I, I, I said earlier this week that uh, I think being plugged into the news 24-7 is a revolt against nature. <laughs> and, and the reason why is we, I don't think we are designed to, to be aware of everything that's happening in the world because the end result is you will just be blackpilled. You will just... You'll be very depressed about everything that's going on. So I don't think we I don't think we have the capacity to be aware of of every sing, every single thing that's happening. And so the the way I approach it is I I do have a few news sources that I go to, but I don't I don't go to them every day and just read everything. What happens is I I get wind of some event happened or or some new new uh, policy is being started, and I I will. I will research that in particular and go go look at things that are being written about that topic as opposed to just sitting down in my chair and, and pulling up ABC News every every morning or something like that. I will say that that's when the ask, one of the uh, one of the benefits that come with specialization is that like following your county commission, right? You're you're, you're going to get a lot less depressing 
material than if you're concerned with you know the state of the military industrial complex, right? So the more you specialize, the more you're gonna get a lot. It's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be more boring, but it will be a lot, a lot less depressing. So that's something else to think of. I think that's all the questions for now. Um, feel free as students to come and ask us personal questions. Like we are, all of us Mises staff, we are here to kind of be mentors to you. We're happy to, um, you know, help guide you if you have, um, you know, if, and once Mises U is over, more than anything else, we want to continue to be a resource. Now that you are, um, have gotten through, you know, gotten through this week, you are now Mises U alumni. And that means that not only do we want you back and we want you to continue coming to our events, um, but now you represent us, right? And so uh, what we really want to see is your smiling faces again. Keep in touch with the Institute, uh, subscribe, and potentially in the future when, you know, when you're, you're ready, uh, please donate, okay? So in order... <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, and I mean that seriously, right? The way that we win is to continue supporting organizations like the Mises Institute so that we can continue putting on programs like Mises U and share with your friends, share, share Mises Wire articles, share uh, Radio Rothbard, you know, share um, all these resources that we have online at Mises.org. Thank you. <laughs>